Good afternoon, everyone. This is our Shake Up the Status Quo session. My name is Wei Ming Wong, Simmons College alumna, class of 2008, and School of Management, class of 2010. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Rupa Unikrishnan. Rupa is the founder and, innovator, uh, and innovation catalyst at Center 10 Consulting, LLC, where she has seeded and driven strategic change and innovation for multiple Fortune 500 companies. Estee Lauder, Johnson & Johnson, and Harman International are among her clients. The work products of her consultancies include transformative strategic plans, new talent acquisition approaches, new product development, vision setting, and organizational culture change. She has held lead roles in strategy, innovation, and operations for Pfizer, BlackRock, and Citibank, and serves as head of strategy for Harman International. A Rhodes Scholar, Rupa holds an MBA and Master of Philosophy in Economic and Social History from the University of Oxford, and holds degrees in History, Politics, and Economics from the University of Madras. Rupa is also a writer whose opinion pieces have appeared in Knowledge at Wharton, the Financial Times, and Atlantic Weekly's Quartz Magazine. In her recent book, The Career Catapult, she faces head-on the reality of an evolving economic environment where job security and career certainty are distant memories, and she acknowledges the fear and discouragement that are natural responses to this modern condition. Then she does what she does best, and that is to guide us with wisdom, insight, and practical advice to a far more useful and valuable response, to an approach that helps us peer into an uncertain future and shape it into our own unique advantage. And this is why she is here today, to help us disrupt our ordinary and reshape our own bright futures. Please welcome Rupa Unakrishnan. Thank you, Amy. Thanks so much. Hello, everyone. I realize it is the afternoon, so <laughs> you want to all just stand up for a second, just you know, shake it out a little. Yeah. <laughs> also, look to the left and right of each other. I say this not in the old like law school thing. You'll all be here at the end of the year, <laughs> but uh, partly because I think this room is full of such great talent. Each of you brings unique experiences capabilities, knowledge. So I'm sincerely hoping that you spend some time today networking with each other, right? So because that is, this is the wisdom of the, of the crowds that we should be tapping into. Please sit. <laughs> All right. I, I'll forget this, so I have to do this. One of the things I have to do because I am surrounded by social media geniuses, including my husband and my kids, we're going to take a selfie. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. I'm going to stitch that together. This happened. Now it happened. If it wasn't on social, it didn't happen. <laughs> All right, but, but do go ahead. Let's, let's connect, right? Let's remember to connect. I want, I, how many of you are on Twitter? Okay. Those of you who are not on Twitter, get on it. <laughs> not because I want you to follow me. I do want you to follow me at Rupa Online. But more importantly, one of the things I'll talk to you all about today is about stalking trends. And Twitter is a great space for listening. Don't feel like you have to tweet about your breakfast. In fact, please don't tweet about your breakfast. <laughs> But follow people. There are people who are putting out some, you know, there's some really interesting insights, really interesting deals that you get a first glimmer of on places like Twitter. So get on right. All right, so let, before I jump into the content, let me give you a little bit of history about my book. Um, so I wrote this book partly because, uh, The Career Catapult, um, because I was seeing a series of trends. So I, I had um, been in, as you heard, been in strategy roles, uh, talent roles, et cetera, in some uh, great companies, and decided I hit a certain birthday. We won't talk about it. And, um, <laughs> and my kids were at a certain age, and I decided I wanted to take a little time and do something that would make me super happy, which was start my own consulting practice. And I did that for five years. And in that period, did strategy work. But every time I would work on the strategy, I'd work with a leader who'd then say, 
what does this mean for me? What does this mean for my organization? Because we're talking change. What is going to happen to my career, my people's career? And in other cases, I would find people coming to me to say, let's talk about where these trends are headed, because I'm feeling lost. So there were these moments of vulnerabilities, and I wanted to make sure that what I was able to do one-on-one, -on -one, I could at least sort of share more. And I started putting it down in a blog. And then a publisher called me and said, if we bung it all together, you got a book. And I'm like, you got a deal. Right? <laughs> but it took a lot more work than that. It sound, make it sound easy. It's an interesting exercise, right, writing a book. But what I'd like to do today is distill some of those thoughts. And I, what I did in the book was also to tell some of the stories I ran into. So let me start with one experience I had. So what you're looking at here um, is the um, uh, sort of Mercedes-Benz Automotive Museum in Stuttgart. It's structured in a way that you go in, you go up to the top, and then you spiral down to sort of experience the museum. It sort of seems to be the thing to do. Um, what do you think the first exhibit is in this museum? Take a guess. Car, right? I've heard people say motor, carburetor, whatever, conveyor belt. It's a horse. <laughs> Those are my kids there. They were younger then than teenagers now. They teach me every day because I'm mom. Um, but it's a horse. And why is Mercedes-Benz talking about a horse? You'd think that, right? <laughs> it's a little bit about horsepower, but it's also because they wanted to talk about a time when it was all about the horse. What you have here is a quote ostensibly by Emperor Wilhelm II, the last of the Kaisers. And he says, I do believe in the horse. The automobile is no more than a transitory face. OK, so you'd think, OK, this sort of old regal monarch. No. He was talking. He was in his mid-30s when he was saying this. He had actually ensured that the Berlin um, sort of the educational system had established new engineering degrees. He knew enough to force them to spend money on engineering. And yet, he couldn't get his head around the fact that the horse was already the past. You can laugh at him, or you can recognize that we're talking about a time when they were building their lives around the horse. They built their homes around those carriage walks. Can you visualize those old homes where you'd have the cobbled area where the horse would come in with the carriage and let people out? They were building their cities around cobbled stones, because that's what you needed for horses. They were building, they, they were building lampposts at the right height so that it wouldn't scare the horse, and you could light it from horseback. They built their lives around the horse. So it didn't matter to them that there was this amazing contraption that was clearly existent. They couldn't get past the horse. Now, now we're beyond that, and I remember having a conversation about what is it that we have in our heads that are so obvious in our lives that we can't imagine getting around it? We can talk about that in a second. But I, I, t I was talking to the Mercedes-Benz leaders, and they had clearly here a great point, right? Couldn't get past the horse. So they asked me, at the end of a lecture like this, what do you think the next transformation point would be? And I said, gravity. I mean, talking about eight years ago, and they all rolled their eyes. Fast forward eight years, and they've started investing in flying cars, flying cabs, right? Because gravity is going to be the biggest rate limiter for cars. There's only so much roadway. And they are, of course, working on autonomous drive, but mostly they're working also on autonomous helicopters. So the good thing is they got in there. The bad thing is it took them eight years. <laughs> but the interesting thing is that they engaged. And every time you feel the urge to eye roll, I think sort of stopping to say, why am I rolling my eyes? Because this is something that clearly is making me uncomfortable or getting me to the period of disbelief that maybe I should shift around, right? So, so let's talk a little bit about what happens in our lives. Inevitable, we need to get into a car to commute. That's shifted in our lifetimes, right? We, um, we need to switch on the TV to read the news. You need to read news on broad sheets of paper. These are things that have shifted, and along with it, whole career paths have either evolved or disappeared. 
So remembering that and engaging around, you know, I'm, I don't mean to shock and awe, but it is, an, <laughs> it is an interesting sort of nugget to bear in mind about assumptions that we take and what we make about ourselves. So I'll tell you a little bit about a jolt, and, and, and I'll give you some grounding around why I feel passionately enough to, uh, to do this um, and to, to put myself out there is when I was um, about 10, um, I had I discovered a passion in a sport. Um, I also was the daughter of a police, you know, head of police in India, chief of police. It turned out that there were political forces that didn't really enjoy his points of view. He disappears when him, when I'm 13. By the time I started representing my state in the sport, it's, it's rifle shooting. It's a sport, uh, very zen sport. Unfortunately, it's a little messed up here. But, <laughs> but um, I'm representing the state, and my father disappears for two years. We have no, no idea where he is. So there I am, representing the state, and the state has disappeared my dad. And I say, well, this is interesting. I am still going to continue, and I'm going to still continue representing now the state. And even in, in, within the next two years, I was representing the country. And at, at the same time that there were articles about my dad, there were articles about me, different sides of the paper. And I was at that point realizing it was important for me to control the, the rhetoric around our family and my, my, my own storyline. More importantly, I was realizing that my fondly held belief till the age of 13, which was that I was going to be in government service, had disappeared. That wasn't happening. So I had to really redesign what I was going to do. So I took the time over the next two years, tested science, tested economics, and said, oh, you know, I'm going to keep doing what I enjoy doing, because it's not going to work out if I just do what, the, what, what, is, what I'm told is the best thing to do. And I crafted a, a storyline for myself. I happened to write, um, write poetry. I happened to shoot. I happened to do well in academics. All things that nobody could take away from me. They couldn't disappear, those achievements. So I got the Rhodes Scholarship. I went on, and, and I'm here in my red, white, and blue, um, <laughs> and pretty happy. Now, this was a jolt that was done to me. Um, and having it done to me this early in my life meant that I, it built in me a certain sort of resilience as well as the, the sort of intent to always look at something and say, what if it goes away? Now, that's not a comfortable way to be. But it's certainly a way to be, <laughs> because in a time when we are evolving, where technological disruption happens to us, jolts like this may not happen, but there are jolts happening to us all the time. Whether it is through careers, through industries, to states, right? Um, whole loca localities cease to exist because of fracking, for example. What happens then? Are you picking up? You're moving? What happens to your careers? What happens to jobs there? Jolts will happen. And how we create a sort of more robust set of capabilities is how we can succeed and grow, right? So that's part of what, um, what sort of makes me write about some of what I think. Now, while I was in my career trajectory, I had the chance to watch a series of companies because I got into strategy consulting. And the companies that succeeded, that evolved, were ones that did a couple of things, right? They would look and understand what their core capabilities are, really understand. They would understand what the um, dynamics of their industry are that are going to shift, knowing what's going to get disrupted. They would evolve into, uh, put aside certain dominant logic in their own organizations, like how they think about what makes them successful because that's not going to be successful tomorrow. And, and then they sort of make a change plan. So I was intrigued because I said, if companies, good companies are able to do that. I was, I was part of Aetna's transformation. There used to be huge, huge number of lives that they would cover, made very little money. They just said, OK, we're going to retool that. We're going to change our offerings. We're going to be relevant to a smaller number of people, but more agile. And watching that, I said, why don't we do that to ourselves? Why do so many people get to a point in their careers where they're saying, I feel like I kind of was an accidental tourist in my career. I feel like I've kind of you know, just happened to fall into it out of school, and now I'm here you know, 15 years later. Or I did everything I was told to do, and they've changed my job description on me. Because that happens all the time. Um, 
we shouldn't be accidental tourists, so how do we go about thinking about our careers in the same way companies rather methodolic, methodically think about themselves? That's part of what drove my thinking here. So I'm going to ask you all to do an exercise. You'll have paper and pen, take it out. If you want to do it in your heads, that's fine. What if you think about yourself in the same critical way that companies do, do right? So now, think about what is the value? What is the function you provide, right? So if Aetna thought they were in the function of providing healthcare, let's, let's think about that. Initially, they, they thought they were in the business of doing insurance, and then the transformation was thinking about themselves as a healthcare company. So here, what is the function you think you provide? When do you think your services get used? By whom? Where do you provide these services? And what is the modality? How? How do they access your services? Right? So, say you're an accountant. You provide your services to your company, 9 to 5, in, in the office. Oh, yeah? Now, I'm just as an example. Take a second. Now, if you were to rethink that framing a little, an accountant also is somebody who knows how to work with resources, asset management, understands the ins and outs of, of managing transactions, OK? They're technically really, even though we say 9 to 5, we're really on 24-7. Right? Let's face it with our mobile devices. And quite often, if you're in a global uh, organization, you're doing all of this on the phone and you are accessible online all the time. So push that definition a little further. So you've now sort of reframed what you do. Now push yourself to say, what would discomfort look like? Like how would you push yourself to redefine yourself in a way that makes you a little more uncomfortable? So this person who's an accountant who's now starting to think about herself as a resource management person, what if they were thinking of themselves as a trade manager, manager of trades, because you're doing the ins and outs? What if you said you don't have to be in the office, you don't have to work for one company, and you can be online at any point in time? Does that change your profile? Does it make you someone else? How would you go from your definition to the next level definition to maybe even an opposite way of thinking about yourself? Hold that thought, right? Can I ask somebody to talk about what they, what they described? Trust me, if you don't stand up, I'm going to call on you. <laughs> Lady in blue. <laughs> How do you describe yourself now? <laughs> Sorry to do this to you. <laughs> So I work for a technology group, and my job is to motivate and inspire my team and remove their barriers. I like that way of thinking, yeah. <laughs> so you're defining yourself as a, a leader and a manager who, who's an who removes obstacles. Now, I could see that person working anywhere, anytime, any country, right? You've just sort of freed yourself from, you're probably, I don't know, director of X in Y or whatever, right? I mean, like your job description sounds very different from the way you can define who you are. That's really the challenge we face every day. Because what happens on a daily basis, a job description goes out. There are 10 capabilities that the job description asks for. We generally, and HB, even the Harvard Business School has proven this, right? <laughs> Women will look at this. If we don't do 80% of it, we're not going to apply. Men will see 20% of it and say, I think I can figure out the other 80%. <laughs> and they apply, and they get it. So what is it that we can do to firstly expand the way we think about our capabilities? That's step one in really catapulting yourself out of where you are, especially if you're stuck, to rethinking the way you can be going forward. All right? As I'll tell you a couple of stories just to underscore the possibilities. Um, so Laila Chirayat, she's now called Laila Jana. Um, she was an analyst who had studied at Harvard, et cetera, development studies, 
From the age of 16 or so, she'd started spending her summers in Africa, various countries in Africa, and she was convinced she wanted to do development work. By the time she'd finished her schooling, actually, she'd realized the paradigm around development work, we're talking sort of early 90s, yeah, mid 90s, early 2000s, was very much about crafting a giving relationship. So I won't call it charity, but it was very much a, you know, a north to south kind of relationship. She said, this is not going to work for me. I don't know what the next thing is, but let me try consulting. Got the pedigree, we can go up. And we hired her. And she was, was looking for her first project. I had, at that point, sold a project to an Indian outsourcing company who were re really rethinking who they were. And I said, you know, I need an associate. Not many people who want to go away to India for six months with me, with anyone. Uh, not that I'm an ogre. But um, she uh, said, OK, fine, I'll come. Uh, my dad's of Indian origin. I might learn something about the culture. I said, good. She was very anxious. She said, what do I do? I have no true business skills. I don't know the outsourcing industry, certainly don't know the country. And I said, the whole value of consulting is that if you're curious, if you have the capability, you go from being a novice to an expert soon, because you get plunged right into um, the, the sort of operations. So in a six-month period, with the capabilities and the orientation she already brought to the table, which was around development and her passion for Africa, she learned a whole series of new insights and operational capabilities around outsourcing. And then she did a thing that many consultants don't do, which was to say, if I took A and B, what is the additive C that I can do, right? One plus one can be 10, was her, her, was her vision. And she said, you know, what if I were to take this into Africa and so into Kenya? And I said, well, you know, do you have, a, do you have an educated workforce? Do you have the skills, the capabilities? Do you have the infrastructure? And she said, kind of in all cases, but I'm going to go and see what I can do. She takes the summer off, goes to Africa, and goes to Kenya, and looks around and says, I'm not going to go with some of the big uh, conglomerates there. Not sure I can work with them goes to the internet cafes. Each internet cafe is, has an entrepreneur who runs it, right? Has, has, has lag time between 8 p.m. and midnight when nobody's really using it. There are young, um, motivated, ed educated kids who come and work there and sort of uh, can, can surf, don't actually have jobs. And she says, what if I would create in each of these entrepreneurs an added revenue stream for them and say, if you can train these people, give them some discipline and management, I will find outsourcing work for you to do. And in a three-year period, she went from this concept of you know, 10 loosely managed internet cafes to a business that actually was outsourcing to Google. They do Google technical writing. All right. So this was her, her sort of initial foray into business. And it was pretty amazing. And now, over a 10-year period, has had funding from Richard Branson, hangs out with Mohamed Yunus, and she has, like, you know, Summer Health, Summer Source was the first division, Summer Health is the next one, and she's got a beauty um, line as well, which is where they're sourcing uh, organic uh, materials and sort of using it for, for um, cosmetics. Here is somebody who basically sort of tapped into capability, into sort of a new way of thinking, and serendipity. Because there was no reason that she had to be in, in India. No reason she worked on her first client was in outsourcing. But the serendipity of being exposed to this, she captured that moment of serendipity. right? And here, I mean, I'm immensely proud of her. She is, she's an amazing star. And this was an eight-year journey. But she now basically can pick up the phone and call anyone and, and get them to respond. right? I'll show you another video, which sort of, again, will intrigue you. If it would start. I'm trying to play as a company that produces fun and functional products, and our flagship product is a socket, which is a soccer ball generator. When you play with it, it actually harnesses the energy from play and stores it inside the ball. And our primary target for this product is developing communities around the world. And so the kids there can play with the ball, 
use the energy later for a lamp, charging a cell phone, all of these critical needs that are huge in areas where access to power is unavailable or non-existent. The funds we, we received from Toyota were almost 100% used towards tooling for production of sockets. We had gone through a redesign and we knew what we needed to do to make the ball better, but we just didn't have the funding to actually pay for the tools that would make those balls. Toyota gave us the money, so every ball that's out there now is in direct result from Toyota giving us that grant. So here is a, a case of People who saw a moment, there, was, there were two. These, the two ladies you saw were one is an engineer, one is a, one is a product designer. And they saw this moment where they, they were watching, they'd taken time off from their careers, watching their children play and said, oh, there's an, there's an opportunity there. Um, they brought their capabilities and they also were watching for, an, for a moment. Have you folks ever sort of had a, an insight and said, let me scribe this down? I mean, I'll talk of mine, which was that in 1999, I looked around post-Christmas Day, and saw a lot of these FedEx boxes laying out there. And I told my husband, there's something happening here. It's interesting. I think this internet thing might actually take off. It did. Um, but more importantly, what did I do? I said, you know, clearly, they we're all going to be shopping a lot more, and there's going to be a lot of shipping. And if I'd taken it the next level to say, maybe we should do something in online retail, I'd probably be in a millionaire. If I'd said, let's actually get into shipping, I would. I bought FedEx shares. It did OK. I'm not a millionaire. <laughs> but these are these moments where if, we could, if you can bring to bear that moment of insight and action, there is something magical that can happen, right? I, here is another example of somebody. He's, he was 45 when he passed away. But when he was 25 or 50, when he was 25, he he was a steward in, a, in an airline, and he watched all these coins that people would jingle about as they left from one country to the other, right? Leaving Portugal, what am I going to do with this coin? And he literally said, OK, here's a bag. Put your money in. I'll, trust me, I'll, I'll find a way to spend it for you um, with, uh, or charitably. And he then created a, um, a sort of a movement, which now I think a lot of airlines actually do. It's called Change for Change, or they call it various things. The idea started with this young man um, and in 1978. And he then uh, proceeded to say, I'm not sure that if I give this money to um, nonprofits and things happening to them, he created this framing of children's rights. And there are about a million children who have had a better lives thanks to this young man. So again, moment of inspiration, action, and transformation, right? So if there are three things you can take away, I'd say that don't, don't lose out on those moments of inspiration. They happen in all our lives, right? So what, what is the process? If you want to go about creating and crafting a discipline around this, because it feels random. It feels like it, it sort of happens uh, by happenstance. But what I did was, as I was doing my coaching effort, I started seeing trends. And I said, I want to put some research behind it. So I did uh, interviews with about 50 innovators, senior leaders in, who, had, who had actually die, you know, have in, inventions under their name. I also did a survey of a series of professionals and entrepreneurs, about 400 of them. And I started looking at the trends. And I realized that they, they actually were clumping of patterns. One of them is about sort of digging deep, really bedding down and understanding, but constantly refreshing and un that understanding of who you are. What are your motivating passions, right? When you wake up in the morning, what, what gets you excited about the day? If you're somebody who picks up the newspaper and, yeah, because you're in health day, you're going to read all the healthcare stuff, but you inevitably land up spending real time reading about alternate energy or the environment, Maybe that's a passion that you want to keep an eye on, right? Because not only are you reading up on it, you're staying smart about it, but it clearly motivates you to take that extra five minutes. There's something about that you need to sort of remember. The second is your core competencies. The little exercise that I talked to you about, which is your uh, problem solver who, who motivates people rather than you know, uh, a senior manager or a director. That is key. What is your core capability? What is it you, that you do on a daily basis that is not related to your title, but is related to your strength? And the third piece is about your blind spots, your, your black holes, right? There are things you do that may be holding you back. 
we've, re we've gotten to the stage in our normal discourse where we are constantly finding reasons to blame the other sometimes, right? You know, I was talking, they stopped listening to me, I was engaging in, in, in a sort of a positive, uh, you know, management moment and, and was cut off. Sometimes it is about the environment, it is about the other, but there are times when it's also about potentially about your own habits. How will you learn to understand what that might be that's standing in your way? So there are some capes, simple tools you could use. Literally, getting permission from your colleagues to say, hey, can we dissect what just happened here? Meeting A, we are together, we are, we are laying out a plan, and I can't seem to get any action on it. Is there something I am doing? Understand that, because there is a deep, sticky middle you know, in, in, in many organizations that sometimes we struggle to get beyond. And getting honest, in, you know, effective feedback to work on it, it's actually important. Now, why is this something I want to write a whole chapter about? It's really because when we often read innovation books, self-development books, they work from the assumption of you're blameless and we go from here. And yes, you're blameless and we go from here, but maybe there are opportunities to get better at the basics and then we can build on it, right? So I spent some time uh, on this. There's another reason I thought it would be important because when I, when I initially started my research, this wasn't part of the remit. But I found that one of the questions I asked was, how, of, how many do you spend time on a regular basis, say monthly, thinking about your capabilities, your you know, opportunities to grow, et cetera? And general professionals, I found 30% of them said, yeah, on a, on a monthly basis, yes, I do. Then I found with entrepreneurs, similar-ish number, 34%, right? So, okay, one third of us spend some time reflecting, thinking about what we should be doing differently, what are we good at? Innovators, 74% of them said, literally, some of them said, I actually will put time on a Sunday morning to step back and think about what, what's happening, what's happening with my career. And this was actually a really important insight for me. It was not something I expected in my research. So these were people who were so committed to making change happen that they were going to start from everything in their lives, including themselves really reflecting on them, right? So, and this doesn't have to be something that's onerous. You can, I, I do provide a little bit of a graph that you can use, but if you're, you know, driving to, you know, a round of golf, I'm not going to be normative here, or if you're going to, you know, you're, you're you know, folding laundry, taking the time to just think through what's happened in this month where I have, was clearly super excited, got a lot done, I was in the zone, what happened this month where I thought things were going fine, but things, something got in the way? Now let me identify that, let me think through how can I get under what happened there? And let me really think about this sort of what, what, I'm, what I'm succeeding at. How can I leverage what my, my core capabilities are? That is actually a methodical thing that I'd like for you all to actually put on your calendars to do once a month. Eventually it's something that'll become a habit but it actually requires discipline because the life takes over, right? Our actions, activities take over. The second I'd say is stalking innovation. And I don't mean the creepy stalking, though. <laughs> Think more panther, right? Um, you need to do it all the time. You, you need to be in a constant state of watching. Now, I really enjoy the um, evening, afternoon session of the futurist because I just, I, one of the things that we were talking about at lunch was figure out her website and go to it once a, once a week, once a month. That's a great way of seeing what's happening out there, right? But it's all around you as well. There are, there are multiple ways you can sort of, some people do scribe, others can, you know, what you see there is a word cloud. One of the things you can do is to say, let's me find um, a magazine where I know is going to be future oriented, wired. And once in a month, I will just put it in a word cloud generator, because you can put a website on, and it'll, do a genera it'll generate a word cloud. And you can say, oh, there are four trends that, it, they, that keep getting written about in Wired. I should just figure out what's happening there, right? Blockchain comes up. I know I've rolled my eyes now at blockchain a couple of times, but I'm going to go figure out what it is all about and how, what its relevance is in my life, because clearly it's important enough, right? So. Ensuring that you have a discipline around 
stalking trends is key, and translating that into your life. Just testing to say, OK, right now, in my current role, there may be nothing that blockchain does to me, but this idea of managing identity in a, in a sort of flexible way is clearly something I need to think about. Because it's going, to, it's going to, if I'm not thinking about it, there's a competitor on the other side of the street who's thinking about it, right? So stalk your trends so that you can build on it and you can disrupt. So here again, um, innovation takes constant practice. So innovators and entrepreneurs, 50% of them say, again, sometimes on a weekly basis, they're, they're selecting a trend to understand how is this going to affect this. They're going to select a trend and say, who's doing this well? In companies, in entrepreneurs, it's like, should I be acquiring people who do this well so that I can put them in my startup, in my company? Companies are thinking about it all the time. Can I acquire it? And them, entrepreneurs as humans, are saying, I'm going to go out and figure this out. You know, I'm going to go figure out what the conference is around the neighborhood that I'm going to go, figure, to go work on it. And normal professionals, the folks that are not in the business of creating new products and services, to only 25% of them do this, right? So it's not a heavy lift. It's literally identifying something that you're uncomfortable with, the thing that you hear the word and you're like, everyone's talking about it. Guess what? Everyone's talking about it. So there's somebody out there who can tell you a little more than you already know about it, right? Just take that extra step to figure out what it means. Use your network. I mean, look at this, this room, right? I'm sure each of you has a pretty solid LinkedIn contact list. How different from you is that list, right? Are you a doctor whose 80% of his, his or her clients are doctors? You might want to jiggle that about a little bit, right? Get a couple of patients in there. You know what they have to say. Well, no. But get other folks in there. Get a couple of te technologists in there to understand what telemedicine is going to do to you and your practice. Now, let me share with you uh, an experience. One of the things I do is I do fund startups. And uh, it, once in a while, I'm an angel investor, not, not a big, big, big writer of checks. But a health, uh, t health tech startup came to me um, a while back. And I said, what is different about you? You're, you're taking health data, insurance data. You're doing the analysis. You're coming back with some recommendations. You're going to a corporation. What's unique about you? And they really didn't feel like there was much that's unique. They'll do the analysis and say 80% of your people have cardiovascular issues. They need to go to the gym. Right? Um, <laughs> nothing special. Then I said, OK, this is interesting. When you look at the number of women who work in hospitals, number of people who work in hospitals, doctors' offices, even the folks who make the decision to buy a product like this, because it's usually HR in a corporation that's trying to integrate these health you know, analytics into and, and share it with people, 50% and above are women, right? Take a wild guess about how many people on their staff were women. It's a startup of five people, so what percentage? What percentage of their advisory board were women? Zero. <laughs> You're totally right. All men. So I said, great. What do you want? you want? You want a small check? Here's what I would recommend. You go out. Here's a list of five names. Talk to them. They're all women. See if one of them wants to be your advisor. And by the way, consider coming back, having interviewed a couple of women for your product management role. That's all I said, go talk to them. They came back, they had two female advisors, they had a new female employee. Part of it, and I wrote the check, <laughs> because you know, you gotta, you got, that's, if, you, if you wield the whip, you got to you know, hand it to them as well. The, the interesting thing was, these were good human beings, smart people with the right or, you know, intention. They just didn't have the network, and they didn't have the insight to go actively looking. So the moment I gave them the four or five names, they'd, they'd sort of translated that into action, right? So assume good intent, because sometimes it's, absolute, it's, sometimes it's bias, sometimes it's absolutely bad network. That's what it is. So how do you integrate yourself into other types of networks? How do you broaden your network? These are questions you should ask yourself, both how do you, if you, in the last, the last session we had, we had a scientist who said she really thought of herself as a general management person. 
And part of her job on, on networking, I suggested, was she should look at how many people in her network actually are in the management side of, of, of organizations. And how much time do you spend talking business with them, right? Similarly with you, if you're sort of thinking about expanding your options, make sure that you're building out your network. And on the flip side, how do you find out, find people and say, hey, maybe you'd be interested in having me as part of your network, right? You're, you know, and show that your capabilities are also leveraged by others, because there's a power to you being the giver of this, uh, this network, network capability. Right? So there is, an, there is an element of jolting your network to have value to yourself. So innovators, when you ask them, do you think of networking as a primary capability, like a key capability, 40% of them said yes. Decent number. 35% of entrepreneurs surprised me. I thought they'd say more, right? Because they're in the business of generating revenue for themselves, 35%. What percentage of professionals do you think said this was a capability that they use, they enjoy using? Who I guess? 10%? So this is 20% or 18%. This is basically loss capability. It's a waste, right? This is basically you saying, innovative people do this twice as well as often and as well as me, but I'm, not, I'm going to sort of hang out. I'm not going to do this, right? I'm not considering this important enough to make it a thing I do for my career progression. And this is after decades of us hearing about why networking is important, right? So this is an element of data that I, I had. In each of these cases, I scrutinized the data because I thought, We've heard about networking. We're all on LinkedIn. What are we doing wrong? I think what we're doing wrong is we're not activating it and thinking of it truly as a professional tool. We're thinking of it when we need to send our resume out for the next round, not as a way of building authentic relationships with a broader group of people, because that's what results in expanding your capabilities, right? The, the fourth one is around prototyping. So here's a piece where, um, you kind of, I talked about serendipity, right? Ensure that you see the moment and understand it for the potential it has. Bottle it. I call it bottling serendipity because there is this moment where it's flowing at you and you can either choose to notice it and do nothing about it and maybe buy a couple of FedEx shares or you notice it and you go off and create your own shipping organization, right? So that is about bottling serendipity. The other piece is around sort of taking, uh, you know, if you've heard of design thinking, everyone's talking about it, and they're talking about it because it's a valuable thing. Um, it, design thinking is about sort of really starting, starting a product development process by Im imagining the value to the user and, and sort of engaging around the value rather than here's a technology or here's a product I'm going to build and I'll figure out how to sell it. So think of yourself as that service, right? Usually we say, here's my resume, here's my educational capability, you need to hire me. What if you were to say, hey, here's my resume, here's my capability, but here's a space where you know, everyone's talking about cyber security. Everyone's talking about you know, protection, and information protection. I don't know much about it, but because I understand how revenue streams work, I've been in accounting all my life, I'm going to go figure out how many security startups there are, or, or uh, let's, say, let's take that example, and see whether any of them are making money. By the way, right now, not many of them are. So if you were to go in and say, I'm going to work with you to figure out a financial model where you make money, you'll be golden, right? So really sort of starting to free, design around the need, and then rapid prototyping which means in your career, you can actually visualize what would this role look like. You're going in there and saying, I'm going to be your revenue officer, right? So you start giving it a name, and then you test it, rapid iteration. So go in and say, you're a startup. On Saturdays, I actually have eight hours that I don't use on anything. What if we sit down on every Saturday and we look at your business plan and, and identify new ways for you to be making and billing revenue, pricing structure, et cetera? This is you testing your capability with them, showing them your capability, establishing a value that you didn't have before, 
and then you've prototyped a career for yourself. You've designed it, right? You're from scratch where it didn't exist. You created a role. You're pitching yourself to them by creating value for them. That is user-based design. So another way to think of this is there's this it's Gedanke experiment. That's because Germans like making conglomerate names, compound, compound terms. It basically is a thought experiment. I have Einstein there because what presentation doesn't, can't do with a little Einstein? No. Um, it's because this is how Einstein came up with E is equal to MC squared. He literally had a thought experiment when he was apparently 16 and a half, 17, where he said, if I were to follow a stream of light, like a ray of light, if I were to go alongside a ray of light at the speed of light, if I turned around and looked at the speed light, would I see the point where dark turns to light? And the answer to him was yes. And aha, this moment of the, the sort of relativity came to him. E is equal to mc squared. Don't let me ask me to derive it. It's, we'd be here a long time. But the point is, a thought experiment taken to its logical conclusion can come up with some very interesting insights. So this thought experiment about an accountant who's going to work with blockchain or cybersecurity and create a, a role, all of this can happen in your mind. And you can frame out the storyline in a way that feels authentic to you and works out the kinks. And you test your network out for it, right? Work with, the, work with your network to understand what exactly is this role that you're talking about? What is this cybersecurity industry like? Understand, it, it may, you may be three, three steps away from <clears throat> a cybersecurity expert, but very rarely are you much more than that in this day and age, especially in a network group like this, right? In this room, we're probably just, a, just a one, one click away from them. So figuring out, testing your idea, designing it, it takes discipline and it takes purposefulness, but you can actually do it. So you don't feel trapped. And by the way, if you do this on a regular basis, you're creating a library of roles and options in your head, right? You can be happy as a clam today, but just challenge yourself and say, hey, if I wanted to, if something happened and I had to move to China, what would my relevant role be? Thought experiment. Often, this is, this is I've, I've watched people, I, Sebastian Thrun, who is the, one of the first for folks who, he created HarmonX, uh, Google X, and he um, was one of the first people to think, he, you know, he designed the Google Glasses, he uh, helped start the idea around autonomous cars, okay? Now, he walks into, I had the honor of knowing him, and he walks into the home, and we were, we, you know, he's constantly problem solving. We were sitting there, we had a buffet out, and some, the heat was the same because that's how these turnovers work, right? And he was watching some food was super hot, some food wasn't hot, some was burning, and he said, there's got to be a way to solve this. We should have a sort of an establish uh, an element that could help us test out very early on, very quickly, what the sort of gravity, um, surface gravity, I guess, of, the, of, this, of this product is, of this food is, and it can self-regulate. And I said, don't waste your time thinking about this. But the point being, this is how he, he, this is how he rolls. He's constantly in the thought experiment of life. Now, if you are constantly in the thought experiment of life and you're say, let's, let's make it uh, fun, you know, how is Khloe Kardashian making all this money, right? <laughs> it's kind of complex. It's not as simple as, you know, she looks the way she does. There is, there is more to it. Play this out in your head. What is it about celebrities in America that results in revenue generation? How do I get into this, right? You may not want to be the Khloe Kardashian, but there are like 25 way revenue streams in the, in the path to this celebrity management that's open to all of us to think through. Social media management, God knows. There is, there is a series of thought experiments that you, from where you sit, with your capabilities can generate just asking the question and playing it out in your head, right? We do this about fantasy, we can do it about our careers. <laughs> so this idea of defining, researching, ideation, choosing, implement, this is design thinking. And we can design think our careers and, and sort of rapid prototype. 
you can, there are ways to do this where, in, in the book I talk about low fidelity, medium, and high fidelity. These are just terms that get used in prototyping. And in our careers, it's as simple as first writing a, a statement out. Writing out your current uh, you know, capability. Imagine rewriting your LinkedIn profile so that you'd be relevant to this new space. And then high fidelity is going off and sort of saying, hey, I'll help you start up. You don't have resources. I'll volunteer for you. I'll do this for you for a period of time. I want to just understand what's going on. There are similar ways of thinking about yourself as the product, right? Finally, going extreme. Now, this is the humanistic human part of, 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 of this. When I looked at people who made the big shift, you know, I write about this woman who, um, who she sort of created her own startup because she was learning design and she realized there are only so many jobs in New York in design because they're, it's, the, it's their supply far outstrips demand, right? So she said, how am I going to go about doing it? I'm going to actually work on men's underwear. I'm going to call myself the chief underwearist and I'm going to like create a business. And she just went extreme, created these extreme like fabulously designed underwear and said, I'm going to sell it to women for their men in their lives. It was a five, she had like a five years fabulous life and now she's part of a bigger fashion house. You know, more the pity because she couldn't take her title with her. I think it's a great title. <laughs> but part of the way she did it was to really think, how could I make this happen in the most audacious way possible, right? I'm now sitting here, I'm making skirts. Nobody is taking me on. Oh, I'm going to make men's underwear that are so fabulous they can't ignore me, right? That's a way to be noticed. Another element was de-risking yourself, right? So ensure that you have taken the time to establish what is your tolerance. How can you make change happen? In my case, what I was doing was I would visualize myself back in consulting, even as I was in various strategy roles. And at one point, knowing that I was looking to go independent for a while and be there for the kids for a little bit, I did the math. I got a financial planner, spent four months working through what, what it looked like. And I said, if I made zilch, if I'm a terrible consultant in, you know, by myself, I could, we could last for two years. We were fine, right? But, the, but knowing that you have a time frame in which to experiment is part of the beauty of of de-risking is that you can actually then sort of go forth without holding yourself back. The piece that is this whole 80, 20, 80% 80 of, if you don't have 80% of this um, you know, job description, you won't, you won't apply to it, is partly driven by our self-talk, right? Male self-talk, I can figure it out. Female self-talk, I'm not perfect. So what can we do? <laughs> I'm always reminded of um, uh, Marshall Goldsmith who writes about what got you here won't get you there. He talks about the fact that usually, if you, if you stop and listen, you often find there are 100 people standing behind you saying you can't do it. I said, what? He said, listen to me. And I said, if you turn around, you'll see that they all have your face. It's usually you telling yourself you can't do it, right? So how can you turn around and, in, and find yourself saying, it's going to be tough, but you can do it. Or better yet, you're going to be great at it, right? The self-talk element requires you actually stopping some of the voices in your head. And this is actually something I would actively ask you to do. And just because I'm, I'm going to gratuitously pull up a Star Wars um, reference here. <laughs> this is Ray in the Cave of Mirrors, where she turns around and there are 100 of her. I'm still trying to figure out what he was trying to say there. But I think this is what he was trying to say, which is you have to be your best friend through transitions, because the world can put definitions on you. You don't need to put a negative definition on yourself, right? So reframe how you talk to yourself as well. So these are the five disciplines, right? If you can actually think of them as exercises initially, they then, over time, because they are very intuitive. It was, it was some, I was really hoping to find something like crazy out there that innovators do, right? Jump into ice cold water. That's not what's getting them to effectiveness. The things they do to their own careers and their own opportunities is very much things we know to do, but we just don't, life takes over. We don't put the time and the energy to build these into the way we live. So those are the five disciplines of disruption. 
And um, stay close, stay linked. I think we can all be resources to each other. So you, there's all kinds of ways to find me. Find me and connect with me, all right? Use Twitter. It's a great sort of listening post. Follow people. You don't have to broadcast. You can listen. And you can find any interesting ways to engage with each other. All right. Um, shall we take a moment for q and A? Is that, is that what's next? OK. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Yeah, please. Do we have any mics? <clears throat> ah, I think it's working now. No? OK. Absolutely. Uh, again, I, I will leverage some of my own learnings. I, I was at Pfizer, and I, brought, I was brought in to be in technology. And in my technology role, would work with strategy people quite a bit. And in engaging with them and helping them see how technology is going to drive our strategy, they sort of decided to put me in their team. Working in strategy, I said, you know, the way to do this more effectively, instead of sitting in a, in a box and doing, you know, four boxes, we need to go off and get ideas from elsewhere. So we created an innovation capability, and I did the innovation. And then I spent a lot of time having created all of these you know, great ideas, trying to sell it into the business. And I sort of went to the head of HR and said, you know, the problem is that you don't have leaders who want to take risks. You have to redefine leadership. And she said, come work in talent. So in a period of eight years, I had been in four different disciplines, went back into strategy after uh, having created a strategic workforce process. So to some extent, it is about going authentically with a solution and engaging around that solution. Because it's the same thing you're doing. You're watching the issue. You're creating connections. You're redesigning. You're reframing your job, not by the goals that was put on your, on your you know, goal list. right? You're recreating the problem and the solution. You're presenting it and sort of testing it to your network. And then ensuring that, hey, if, you want, if somebody says you want to take this job, kind of say yes, right? So it sounds easy. It is work. But it is also a sort of a forcing yourself in, out of the discipline into the discipline of engaging. So um, very early on, again, I'll use an example. I landed up talking about a book about uh, sort of a um, Jhumpa Lahiri is an Asian writer. I had that book coming in from the bus, and, I, I, and I, there was a person, an older gentleman, white hair, getting coffee. We land up talking about the book. And he said, you know, and I talked about culture and change, et cetera. And he said, oh, you know, this is great. We should have coffee again. Turned out he was head of all commercial. I had no idea. But by engaging around the conversation, we were able to then have some very serious discussions around what could be different about our commercial operations and how technology could change that. Now, there were many pathways it could have taken. The pa one pathway would have been, you know, hello, take a coffee, go away. Hello, let's talk about the book, go away. Hello, let's talk about the book. Let's talk about what you do. What's your issue that you're trying to solve? Can I have the, you know, temerity to suggest a solution? There are ways to do it. Now, I, I sound like I'm full of it, but in reality, this is just a tiny thing, right? There are people who leverage these moments to make big leaps in their careers. And I, I would sort of really push to say, how do you take every opportunity to, to figure out what the other person's issue is and solving for that? Yeah? It's like good nutrition. You just have to keep doing it. And it feels hard initially. <laughs> Anything else? Right? <laughs> yeah? I think really asking for, oh, sorry. So um, what's your name? Lata she asked about when you bring out new ideas, there's usually pushback. How do you handle it? I think acknowledging it as pushback and saying, you know, I'm going to say something that will probably be controversial say the thing that's controversial or that's an issue 
and identifying the solution and saying, and now what is in it for you to make this work for you? So understanding what the audience is, because all, as I say, everyone likes change until it happens to them, right? So really understanding how is this going to affect their, their role, the organization, et cetera. So the context of such recommendations is often really important. So as a consultant, I usually try to find somebody inside, sort of the, the sort of persuasive insider that I can work with so that they can, you know, they can give me a sense of context, knowing how to go about you know, dealing with it. The other is sometimes figuring out the glossary of the organization, the language of the organization. So in the, in the company I'm in right now, we talk about box one and box three innovation. Box one being iterative, box three being transformative. So if you talk about something that isn't currently in the organization's list, um, just as it stands, it's hard, right, for them to sort of make the bridge. But if I say it in the context of, you know, here's an opportunity, and maybe next year round when we're doing the evaluation of new box three ideas, we could put it on the, on the list. I'm using their language. I'm giving them time to get used to the idea. I'm giving them time to make it their own, right? That is one way to solve for it. It's like make it part of, of their routine, their way of thinking about the world, so that it's not too orthogonal. So these are sort of practical, but often it's about sort of translating. A lot of what I talked about is translating the outside into your career, and similarly translating your insight into the other person's life, so that you're designing around them. It's part of what it is. When you're an innovator, do you talk to your boss or the higher level up? So when you spoke about, you know, you went to the HR and you got into the talent team to change the leadership, did you go to the top, you know, the top no, of the no. HR or how did you work your way up? Well, I, I use, yeah, I mean, when you, when you talk about this, so there's a, there's a thing called drawing a stakeholder map. You know, you, they, they ask you to do in change is you lay out your detractors, people who are going to either dislike you for you or you for your ideas, and then they're going to be supporters. So think of that, two sides of the spectrum. And think of the people who are advocates, who um, are influential, so in the, in, the, in the inner circle. And then they're going to be people who are sort of less, less influential along the way. You really have to sort of have a plan around all parts of the spectrum. So people who are not influential who hate you, it's okay. People who are very influential who hate you or your ideas, you actually have to engage with them so that at least you know what their issues are with the idea. And then you have to very actively lay out who your advocates are, strong, influential, as well as more sort of less influential, but certainly, you know, are positive to you. I would frame the world a little bit like that, right? So that, and then it may turn out your boss falls somewhere, the sort of senior person falls elsewhere, et cetera. Um, usually the senior folks will be in the strong influence part of it, but not always. Sometimes uh, an influencer just happens to be somebody who's been around long enough that they know enough to make people listen to them. So mapping the world that way helps because it removes you from hierarchy because if you think the way this, this you do, right, if, as I advocate, the person won't be your boss forever, right? So, so don't be tied down by hierarchy as much as by the ability to get stuff done. Cool. All right, shall we call it? It's, it's an afternoon. I thank you for paying attention and engaging, right? Thank you very much.